Oh, hi. My name is Mark. Welcome to Piston Twisted Garage. On this episode, we're going to carry on from part one of the Solex overhaul, where we have all the pieces now disassembled. We're going to go through each one. I'm going to identify how to fix them, how to repair them, and at what point you just simply say there's no salvaging some of the pieces. And we're going to take some basic garage tools, make sure everything is prepped up and ready to go, so that we can then go on to part three, which is the rebuild of the Solex carburetor. I think that's everything I needed to cover in the intro. We're going to save these fuel lines for a future video. All right, if you recall from part one, there was damage to the car body and other pieces. And because of the damage, I'm going to be using the spare body for the overhaul along with some of the restored parts I kept from it. These parts include the three brass screws, along with the two float chamber cover screws here and here. I'll also be replacing the spindle screws and washers, the two missing hammer drive screws, an air jet, and the choke tube. With that, I'm also going to be using a new gasket that I cut, along with a replacement throttle spindle and butterfly. Have no fear though, even though I'm putting these pieces off to the side for now, later in the video I'll show you how to refurbish all the replaced parts. For now though, we're going to start with the three cover screws. And when it comes to the reusability of fasteners, I check the threads for any wear and damage. The middle one here has the threads eaten away from corrosion, so it's going to go into the spares pile. Next I'll look at the heads to see if they're stripped. Now these are both really good, so we're just going to pick this one for the demo. So using a wire brush, I'll clean the threads and the head off so I'm working with just the metal. Next, using needle files, I'll work the fastener's head to clean off any burrs and clean up the hex edges if required. Now this one's pretty good on the edges, so it was just the burrs off the top of the head. The same process is repeated for all the brass parts with threads as well. Now keep note though, I use a brass brush for the brass parts and a steel one for the steel parts. This helps prevent any cross metal contamination down the road that could lead to corrosion. With all the fasteners completed, I move on to the remaining metal parts. And here I'm working with the pieces from the throttle cable side of the spindle assembly. Now once all the parts have been shaped up, it's time for a nice hot bath in the ultrasonic cleaner. Now I've heard of a lot of interesting, sometimes secret, recipes used, but as all I want to do is clean off any remaining dirt, oil, and grime, I prefer using Dawn dish soap, and I left a nice little tech note below explaining why. Now, if you don't have an ultrasonic cleaner, no worries. Hot water and the same dish soap with a nylon, bristled, or toothbrush will give the same results. Once everything's finished, I dry them off, and then give them a nice coating of WD-40 to soak overnight. And that is it for this night. Starting with the fasteners again, I need to clean off anything that was lifted by the ultrasonic cleaner and WD-40. Now this is very much a rinse and repeat of the previous methods, but I want to make sure that all these parts are truly clean, especially as we're dealing with our fuel system. Now using a benchtop drill press, I set it to the lowest RPMs and I carefully clamp the fasteners into the chuck. I want to make sure that there's enough force for the jaws to hold the part in place, but not enough to damage the threads or metal. Now please read below and notice I'm taking these gloves off. Now whether using a drill press or a clamp drill, please do this safely. Using thin strips of 1500 grit wet sandpaper and brake cleaners lubricant, I carefully polish the shoulder and head of the fasteners. I won't use this method on threads as I want them left sharp and with as much metal as possible. I repeat this for all the fasteners and finishing here with the last of the cover screws. I'm ready to move on to the volume control screw which needs a bit of extra tension. The convex tip needs to be smooth to function properly. Now first I'll use a brass brush to clean anything in the threads that could fall between the brass and the sandpaper. Notice that wobble? We're going to take care of that right now by using the same grit sandpaper and brake cleaner on a firm flat backing, in this case the flat wooden handle of the brush, and I'll carefully work the shape to the point until it is back to being true. This method can also be applied to the throttle spindle, and I'll demo using the original damaged one. And here's the damaged side quickly polished up, comparing it to the other half that wasn't touched yet. The original butterfly is cleaned by using a scrub pad over a piece of glass. Now first the main faces and then the outside edge are cleaned off. 
To get into the small screw holes, I use a thin strip of the pad and just twist it inside to clean it out. Cleaning the glass off, I'll use a thousand grit sandpaper with WD-40 as a lubricant. And for larger flat surfaces, I like using a figure eight direction to give a nice even sanding. Wiping it off, I'll check to make sure that the surface has been evenly cleaned. This one is gonna be used for a future video on how carbs work. Oh yes, I have plans. The scrub pad over glass is used with all the other metal parts, but for anything with threads, I'll slip a small strip of the pad in and just rotate the part. It's enough to clean the threads without any risk of damage. Now, the only thing I'll caution with the pad is to make sure no fibers get in between moving parts, like on the abutment plate here. A wire brush will go a long way to help remove anything that got in there. Then all the parts that have been cleaned off are put off to the side. With springs, I'll wrap a thin strip around the wire and thread the spring through to get every bit of it scrubbed. They're usually a pain and I found that this method is the easiest to work with. Now I say that, but the throttle return spring is a bit of a beast. The steel wire brush works to get the outside surface clean and then rotating the spring around a strip of the scrub pad over my finger finishes off the inside face. A shot purely for admiration of my work. The starter valve assembly can be an absolute dog to clean and in handling it the assembly may come apart on you. The plate is held in place by a small bit of the brass stem punched at the end and this may come loose over time. As you can see it doesn't take much to separate the assembly and if this happens, fret not my friends, in part 3 we'll assemble it all back together but for now I'm taking full advantage to clean the assembly thoroughly using the same methods previously shown. Lastly, I'm going to replace the spindle washer with a new copper one to make sure that we'll have a good seal on reassembly. With the internal brass components, I'm going to start with the emulsion tube. Now first, the external threads get a cleaning with a brass brush. Next, I'm going to use a mini drill set and I pick up my sets at a local hobby shop for about $10 to $15. Using a number 62 bit in a handheld pin vise, I carefully work it through to remove anything inside of those holes. For the inside of the threads, I'll use a small tube brush and thread it in and out. And once all that is done, using a pipe cleaner and some brake cleaner, I'll scrub the tube until the pipe cleaner comes out clean. For the main jet correction bleed, I'm using a thousand grit sandpaper again with the WD-40 as a lubricant. This is just to clean the top of the jet. I use a brass brush to get into the cutout for the screwdriver as well as to clean the threads. Once that's done, I'm going to be using a fresh pipe cleaner and brake cleaner just the same as I did with the emulsion tube, scrubbing until the pipe cleaner comes out white. The auxiliary jet is a bit of a tricky one. See, there's this hole at the top of it, right about there. And that's the odd thing because it doesn't go through anywhere. The Solex gave us a je ne sais quoi. It's that hole there and the one at the very tip that we need to focus on. Using sandpaper and WD-40 once more, I clean the head of the jet and then use a brass brush on the head as well as on the threads. Now even though that hole doesn't lead anywhere, it's still going to be cleaned out with a cotton swab and brake cleaner. The pipe cleaner method is applied to clean out the larger hole and then a number 78 bit in that pin vise is used to clear out the jet. And that is as far as the bit needs to go. Just for good measure though, I use a pipe cleaner again in case that drill bit pushed something through. The petrol jet is often the dirtiest of all the jets on a Solex, but it's nothing that a brass brush can't help with when it comes to the threads and shoulder. Inside here though, a cotton swab with brake cleaner will be needed. Now with that cleaned out, the number 72 bit in a pin vise is used to clean out the smaller hole of the jet. After that, you guessed it, pipe cleaner with some brake cleaner to scrub out the remainder. Lastly, the main jet. Although that hole looks large enough, we will not be using a pipe cleaner as it'll get lodged and cause damage. Instead, I'm using a number 57 bit with my fingers to clean it out. I prefer this method as it's the easiest way to ensure I don't inadvertently bore out the jet to a larger size. And once cleaned, the jets are put off to the side with the other parts before a final rinse and carb cleaner just prior to assembly. With carb cleaner and a wire brush, the copper floats need little effort to clean up, but a lot of caution. 
These are held together with a small amount of solder, so I hold the float in a way to prevent any twisting as I scrub. Now moving on to the needle valve, I want to make sure that my cleaning won't damage the plunger inside. So with the plunger fully extended, dirt and debris can fall into that small opening there. So I just hold my finger against the plunger to keep it closed while I use the brass brush on just this portion here. Once done, I'll wipe off anything remaining off that face and then apply some tape to keep it sealed. Now I can safely clean the threads and the remaining faces of the needle valve. On the face you'll see two small holes on either side of the plunger, and when the plunger is open, this is where the fuel flows out to fill up the bowl. To clean the inside of the valve, make sure the plunger is open. A quick test to see if the needle valve functions can be done by pushing the plunger in with paper towel. A quick spray with carb cleaner should shoot backwards, not forwards. If the valve leaks, the paper towel will have wet spots. And here the towel is dry, so I know the valve works. If yours fails, the tech note below will help you out. Here I have all the main body pieces and choke tube. Now, even though the body is broken and can't be easily repaired, it'll be used to demo the steps needed to overhaul your carb. The straight edge shows significant warping on the face that mates up to the cylinder barrels. This is going to cause air to leak between the gasket and the carb, causing performance issues. So to fix this, I use a piece of glass and three emery cloths, coarse, medium, and fine, in order to hand plane the surface until it's perfectly flat. Starting with the coarse grit and WD-40 as a lubricant, I start to sand away the excess metal using a figure eight pattern. With a square, I'll check to make sure that I'm working the surface at the correct angle. And here it all checks out. Once I'm happy that the surface is flat, I'll clean the glass and repeat this with the medium grit and then the fine grit. What I'm left with is a nice flat metal surface and I repeat this for all the metal surfaces that made up with another piece to make sure that it all fits correctly. Once complete, I'll bathe the parts in the ultrasonic cleaner to get rid of any oil, grime and dirt before further cleaning. And with the majority of the crud removed from the body, I'll use a wire brush to clean up the easy to reach areas. For the harder to reach spots, it's a combination of carb cleaner, scrub pads and cotton swabs. Once done, the inside of the body parts were cleaned up using a rotary tool and an abrasive buffing wheel. I like 120 grit as it does wonders to remove all that corruption without damaging the parts. For tighter spots, I use strips of scrubbing pad and cotton swabs like I am here with the opening where the butterfly spindle will go. All the small ports and passages are cleaned with carb cleaner and a cotton swab and then blown out using compressed air. The last piece is the choke tube and I clean this piece up using a scrub pad for the outside and the rotary tool with the same abrasive buffing wheel on the inside. Good as new. So that is the refurbishment of all the Solex carb pieces. Now if you've got any comments, questions or advice, be sure to throw them down into the comment section below. I love hearing from each and every one of you. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button along with the notification bell so that you know when part 3 of the carb overhaul gets posted up. As always, thanks for watching. Cheers.